Today is Monday, July 28th, 2014. My name is Jason Higgins and I'm an intern with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at the OSU Library. I'm in the OSU Library in Stillwater to interview Glade Presnell to discuss his time in the CIA, the United States Army, and his time at OSU. This is part of the Spotlighting Oklahoma Oral History Project. Mr. Presnell, thank you for joining me today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Let's begin with when and where you were born. Uh, Goddard, Kansas, 1942. That's just west of Wichita, a few miles. And what was it like growing up in that area? It was good. I grew up on a wheat farm, uh, the little town of Goddard. Uh, the boys in my class there got to play baseball and stuff this summer. I got to work on the farm, <laughs> which at the time I didn't think was too good, but in looking back, I thought it was a wonderful way to grow up. Hmm. And did your father farm? He farmed uh, really from the late 30s until he retired in about 19, I don't know, 84 or something like that. But in the mid 50s, he had his fourth child, my younger brother, and he realized he couldn't make it farming. So he went in to Wichita and got a job as a Farm Bureau insurance agent and after a very few years became very successful but he wouldn't give up farming. <laughs> so he farmed and sold Farm Bureau insurance until he was 69 years old and farmed till he was about 75. And were you the oldest brother? Yes, I was the oldest brother. And what was it like growing up being the oldest brother? Did you pick on your little brothers at all? Not at all. He was 13 years younger than I was. Oh. So uh, he was like five years old when I went away to college. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit about education growing up, your schooling. Uh, the little town of Goddard had, I think, a pretty good school, but I was not a serious student at all. I mean, I. Uh, when I got into high school, all I cared about was sports, and I could make generally B's without studying, and I don't ever remember taking anything home uh, for homework. Uh, I just was not a very dedicated student who could make the B on a roll without studying, so that's what I did. <laughs> what sports did you play? Basket, uh, football, basketball, and track, which is all the school offered at the time. And did you have a coach who was an inspiration for you at all? He was. Uh, Gil Huff was his name. Uh, Goddard had not won a football game in three years when I was a freshman, and he was a new coach that year. We didn't win any games that year uh, for about the fourth year in a row for the school, but by the time we were seniors, we only lost one game. Hmm. So he was a very successful coach. Absolutely. And were you involved in any activities such as the Boy Scouts, Equal Scouts, or anything like that? Yes, yes I was, Jason. In fact, I was very active in 4-H and I, I look back now, I gave a talk at Toastmasters a few months ago in which I credited 4-H for basically all my successes in life. Wow. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about your path to higher education, uh, to college. Uh, my parents expected me to go to college in Kansas State, being the state land grant university, was the cheapest option, uh, I suppose, and at that time they were deeply in debt. My, my parents, uh, in the 40s and 50s especially, but really all her life, my mother had severe medical problems. I remember one time when I was about seven or eight years old, she spent six months in the hospital and another nine months in bed at home, uh, nonstop. So, and she had several cases, not that long. But they were deeply in debt, um, I think 40 some thousand dollars and that's 1950 dollars. So I went to college at that point and uh, again I was not a serious student and to be honest uh, almost funked out and then uh, as I said 4-H saved me. <laughs> what was your major? I started in business because my father insisted on it. He always wanted to be a businessman, felt I should be. I had absolutely no interest in it. Uh, uh, I didn't have any interest in school either, looking back, but it's basically business. So at the end of my sophomore year, the State 4-H had a program called IFYE, I -F -Y -E, International Farm Youth Exchange, and I applied for that, and even though I was on the, I was on the dean's list, but it's not the one you wanted to be on. Oh. Uh, but even though that, they, they uh, approved me, and I went to Italy for six months to live with farm families all over the country. When I came back, I was 21. Uh, I had seen the world, travel broadened me, and I switched to political science and got a job that paid my own way. It took me three years to finish, but 
because I was working so much. But uh, I finished with decent grades and, and uh, graduated at the age of uh, 24. So was there a specific episode where you realized that political science was more of an interest for you personally? Or was I think while general? I was in Italy and, and reading about the U.S. while you're living abroad, uh, seeing the politics of, of uh, Italy was really eye-opening. Mm -hmm. And I realized that's where my interest was. So even though the, the money was probably not there, I decided that that's where I, my interest was. Okay. And uh, so take us to your graduation. Do you recall that day at all? Was it significant for you in your it, life? It was probably for one reason. I would have probably still remembered it, but this would have been 1966, and our graduation speaker was President Dwight Eisenhower. And so I remember him and his speech very well. Wow. Uh, interesting side note there, uh, when General Eisenhower, after World War II, uh, I believe it was Columbia University, uh, offered him the presidency of the university and he said you're talking to the wrong Eisenhower. I think there were seven brothers in the family. They were all successful but one of his brothers, Milton, was the president of Kansas State University, president of Penn State University, and president of Johns Hopkins University and he never had a doctorate. He did all that with the masters if I remember right. So when they called Dwight Eisenhower, he said, you need to be talking to my brother. But, but he accepted the position for a couple of years, I think. Wow. And were you a first-generation col first college graduate? Uh, my older sister had graduated, but my parents had not. No. Oh. No. So you graduated in 64. 66. Um, 66, sorry yeah. about that. Can you, so were you abroad whenever Kennedy was assassinated? Oh no, in fact is, I, had a, I, I that job I got that was 30 hours a week and then I worked full-time construction in the summer, that job was, uh, it would have been in the, uh, when Kennedy was assassinated, I was at Farm Bureau applying for a job to be a janitor, they hired janitor boys. And I remember I was at the reception desk when all the little hubbub started and we realized that uh, the president had been shot. Wow, and did that impact you personally? Oh, definitely, yeah. And did it uh, inspire any patriotic fervor at all, or? Not really, no. Okay. Just great regret. And was there any, what was education like going, growing up during the Cold War era? I remember in grade school, and I don't remember in high school, but I presume did. I remember we had drills, you know, crawl under your desk and <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, I remember, was a time of some concern, but other than that, I didn't worry too much about it, and I don't think my friends did either. Okay. And so uh, you pursued graduate school after graduating, correct? No, no, I was drafted oh, I'm sorry. I was drafted into the Army as soon as I graduated. Well, not as soon as I graduated. I had a little side note again I can credit to 4-H. Uh, give you the nickel version. I, Graduated in June. I, I went home waiting for my draft notice. I tried to get out of the Army by uh, applying for the National Guard in Kansas, but the wait was six months. I tried to go to Boeing Aircraft like several of my friends did who had majored in engineering because I could get deferred at Boeing, but they didn't have any need for a political science graduate. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I think you had to serve three or four years if you joined up. If you were drafted, you only had to serve two years. So. Uh, I remember my dad took me in, or excuse me, I got a little sidetracked there. So I, I got a job with one of my dad's friends who owned a refrigeration business, just doing general labor, driving a truck, that kind of thing, and and uh, until August. And, I, and one day I got called up to the owner's office, and he said, hand me the phone, had a strange look on his face. I got online, the guy said, uh, this is so-and-so from New York City, and you've been nominated by the National 4-H Foundation to uh, represent the youth of America on a trip to India. Uh, you're one of three applicants to cover agriculture. Can you come tomorrow and interview? And I said, I guess so. And he said, well, there'll be a ticket for you at the airport. So I flew to New York. They interviewed me. Uh, and as I said, there were three for that position. And they called me in the hotel that night and said, you're going to go. And I called Dad and he said, well, you may not. You got your draft notice today. <laughs> wow. So. I said, well, see what you can do, Dad. And so uh, 
When I got home, he had called a representative from our district, the U.S. representative, and named Garner Shriver, who was a friend of Dad's because Dad was president of the County Extension Council. And uh, Garner had called a uh, draft board, and they got me delayed. Hmm. So Dad took me to the bus station in Wichita, and I told him as I got on the bus, I said, Dad, I'll see you two years from today right here, because I had no intention of staying in the Army. Uh, 27 years later, I retired <laughs> from active duty and reserve total. Wow. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the local draft board? Uh, did, did you have a positive experience with that? I mean... I Never don't... saw them. I uh, just got, uh, just got uh, notices from them. Did you and your, and your friend circle get drafted as well? Did you have friends get drafted? You know, not really. There were 18 boys in my graduating class. And I believe I was the only one that got drafted. Wow. Uh, some of them got married and had kids, if that's the case, you weren't drafted. Some of them, as I say, went to work for Boeing. Uh, but we had our 50th year of reunion four years ago, and I checked around, and none of the other 14 had, had uh, been drafted. Wow. So, where did you go to basic training at the Army? Uh, Port Bliss. Was. Texas, yeah. And uh, what do you recall from your basic training? The thing I recall is that they, they didn't have a 4-H pro or a <laughs> Boy Scout program where I grew up. And I'd always loved reading about the old mountain men and, and all the outdoor stuff. And, and I liked basic training. For one thing, the drill sergeants were wonderful. Uh, they were just true leaders and set a fine example, at least the ones I had did. And we got to do fun things like shoot machine guns and go on hikes and you know the PT didn't bother me I've been real active in athletics so I, I've actually enjoyed basic training. How did you integrate being a college educated draftee with the rest of your group? Well you know that's funny because Jason people of your generation don't realize it but there were a lot of people uh, my platoon in basic of 40-some guys, I'd say about a third of them had college degrees. And we had graduates, we had graduates of, of Ivy League schools in my, in my platoon. Uh, we had one fellow who had played football at the University of Kansas, and his, he was a starting center, I believe. And uh, his younger brother played football there and went on to become the quarterback of the Chicago Bears. So. Uh, in those days when the draft, you could get out of the draft, and a lot of people did, mm -hmm. but a lot of people didn't. And I consider it one of the best things our country ever had because it exposed me, a farm kid with a, a college degree, to Ivy League graduates and to tell you the truth, hoods off the street of Chicago, and it was just a wide variety of people. So was there a racial integration as well? Was there any tensions at all during your training? There wasn't obvious because the army didn't allow it, but there were. There were. I remember uh, there were some incidents where the, a couple of the blacks in our platoon were surreptitiously uh, harassed, and by that I mean they couldn't openly do it, but they did it surreptitiously. And would that been by their by their constituents, by their leaders? By no, 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 not at all by the leaders. In fact, as our main drill sergeant was black himself. No, it was by the others in the platoon. You know. Okay. Those guys. So after your graduating of basic training, where did you go from there? Fort Lewis, Washington for advanced individual training and that was another two months. Basic was two months, AIT was two months, but I got to Fort Lewis and those of us I guess it because I got talked into something in basic training. They called me in and they really pushed me to sign up for infantry officer school. Hmm. And I had no interest. But after about the third pressurized meeting where they explained the benefits of it, I thought, hey, that would be a better be an officer than an infantry grunt. So uh, I had signed up for infantry OCS. I got to Washington and they had a program of a two week leadership school so that you could be a platoon leader of 40 some guys in AIT. I went to that two-week leadership school and it was it was extremely interesting and uh, then I was a platoon leader in AIT in charge of 44 of my fellow trainees. 
how did you get involved in the leadership program? Um, were you recommended? I, yes, but I assume, I don't know for sure, but I assume because I was a, a, an approved applicant for empty officer school, they figured that you know I'd, I'd make a good platoon leader. Okay. What tactics were uh, involved in your training at that point? A lot of infantry. It was advanced individual training, and I was still being trained as an infantryman. So there's a lot of field exercises, combat type exercises, and that sort of thing. Would you describe it as conventional warfare? Oh yeah, yeah. One of the interesting things I'll never forget is we were sitting in class one day, and all at once a company commander rushed into class and said, "There's a national emergency. Whoever, ever." able body is being called up, get back to your barracks, put together what you have to go, you're leaving on the plane in 30 minutes. And I, you know, I was a little older than most of the other guys, and I sit there and snicker to myself, said this is another exercise, and, and uh, but I went along with it and went back, and they said to write a note to your family, you know, your last chance to send something, we'll send them on to your family. So we wrote a note, and I wrote, I wrote some silly little note thinking it was all a ruse. And then they put us on a, a truck and took us out to the big airport and uh, set us on the grass on the, at the end of a runway. And uh, here comes the biggest airplane the Air Force had. I don't know what it's called, Strata Fortress or something like that. Humongous airplane. And we see it come in and it lands and it taxis over to us and turns around. And the big door comes down and they run us onto the plane. And we'd been told a couple weeks before that just to take off in this plane cost the government seven or eight thousand dollars in fuel and that was sixty seven dollars wow. so at this point I'm saying maybe this is not an exercise and the thing went down the end of the runway and started to take off and then shut down they brought us back and said okay now we're going to read those letters in class that you wrote to your family <laughs> so we had a good laugh about that wow. yeah. okay so um were you preparing yourself mentally at this point for Vietnam? Well, I don't know that I was preparing, but I fully expected to go, you know, infantryman in 67, I mean, sure, that's where I expected to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you wouldn't describe it as preparation, but what were some of your thoughts on the, on the possibility of going to Vietnam? Oh, I was sure I was going to go, and the, the politics of it, I, I you know, the, the, the anti-war things were starting to ramp up at then, but to tell you the truth, we were so isolated on these army posts, we, we, and we didn't get any news, we didn't watch TV or anything, so we didn't get it directly, but uh, uh, I had some questions, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me, so. Was there a personal fear, though? Not really. You know, what happens, happens was my attitude, and I just felt that the better I trained myself, the better chance I'd have of making it. Absolutely. So after AIT, you went to uh, infantry officer training? At school? Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay, and what, what was involved in your training process there? Uh, much higher level training uh, as far as infantry. I mean, you had to learn how to chart artillery, you had to learn how to fire all sorts of weapons, you had to get into the physical training. We had something like 230 in our platoon to start, and that, when we graduated in six months, I had 143 left. The washout rate was pretty close to 50%. Wow. Uh, physically, it was very, very demanding. Hmm. What contributed to such a high number of those who dropped out, was it the classwork or the physical work? Or? I think for the most part the physical work, but also there were just some that weren't qualified. Okay. Uh, you know. okay. And were there any events or episodes during this time that you recall that were significant? <laughs> well, I, I, a couple things. Number one, this is a infantry school. And like I said, I had nobody in my family ever that was in the Army going back to the Civil War. Hmm. And so all I knew is what I'd read in books and heard about sleeping in the mud and foxholes and that sort of thing. And I didn't have a big impression of the Army when I went in. When I went to infantry school, I told my family, the worst professor, or the worst teacher I ever had in infantry school was a far better teacher than the best teacher I ever had in college. They were outstanding teachers at the infantry school. They really, really were. The other thing I remember is somewhat humorous. Uh, it's a six-month program, and after about five months, they started drawing down the number of, of officer candidate 
battalion, training battalion, because the need went down. And our commander for the first five months, had, uh, company commander, had been had gone to the University of Tennessee on a track scholarship, and he was a distance runner. And he ran us into the ground. I mean, he, we ran everywhere. We ran miles and miles every day. Well, they closed that and moved us down next to the jump towers, which are these 250-foot towers for airport training, and to a, a company that wasn't commanded by such a guy. So all the tacks, the training officers, the first time we messed up as a company, they said, we're going to run you. So they took us across the street and around the, tr the jump towers was a two and a half mile track. And a whole company of 140 some guys uh, started running in step. And uh, five tacks went with us. And at the end of the first circuit, two tacks dropped out. At the end of the second circus, circuit, two more dropped out. And there was only one left. <laughs> and we got halfway around that one and he started throwing up and told us to go back home. There wasn't a one of us that was hardly out of breath. We had run six, seven miles, and we were, none of the 140-some were hurting because we were in such great shape. Wow. We ran those tacks into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what was graduating from that school like? Oh, it was wonderful. It was just, uh, it was great. They had a nice ceremony. My parents and my younger brother came down for it, and, and uh, it was great. had a nice ceremony. And was there a sense of pride in graduating? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And how were you trained to be a good leader at that point? Oh, the leadership training was outstanding. I mean, you had your chance to lead your platoon or your squad, or you had a chance to lead and be led. Uh, they taught you leadership principles and how to manage, and uh, it was just wonderful training, really. Oh. So after that graduation, where did you go from there? I stayed right at Benning. I volunteered for airborne school, so I went through the two-week paratrooper school uh, and uh, finished that, and then they assigned us to, uh, well, this is the thing. Even though I graduated on the 1st of February, 1968, and that was the start, first day of the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and I knew where I was going. But they announced the assignments for the 143 of us, and I was one of the handful that got assigned to the Intelligence Branch. So they sent me to Intelligence School in Fort Oliver, Maryland, which is right in Baltimore. Uh, I went through the Counterintelligence Officers course there. Um, before you get there, um, what was airborne school like? Oh, well, th a lot of people complain about the physical aspect of it, but having finished with the way I told you, we didn't have any problems with physical. The fear of heights wasn't uh, wasn't a concern to me. I never had that. Uh, they have what they call ground week and tower week, and then the graduation. Ground week is where you go through all, the, they put you into harnesses, mm -hmm. we call the nutcrackers, and so you learn how to manipulate the harness, they pull you up off the ground about three feet, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, second week was tower week, and they had 34-foot towers, and they had guidelines, and you had to get up at the top of the 34-foot tower and jump out and, uh, and uh, go down the guidelines. Now the interesting thing, I asked why 34 feet, and I was told at the time because I, you know, people psychiatrists or they found out that fear height increases up to 34 feet. Then above that, it doesn't matter. So, 34 foot towers, and then we had to all jump off the 250 foot towers, and these were big derrick-like towers that had arms out with four uh, parachutes, and you you had to be pulled up 250 feet and then flown out, and then of course. The final two days was uh, two or three days was jumping out of airplanes. You had to jump five times to qualify. Mm. Do you remember your first jump? Oh yeah, yeah. It was beautiful. There was a slight breeze, probably five miles an hour. It's a beautiful day. I went out with no qualms. My chute opened. I I did the proper PLF parachute landing fall, and and it was like a feather. It just I don't, if you if you stood up the drill sergeants would really get on you. And uh, so I purposely fell down. I could have just stood up. My roommate didn't show up after the first jump and found out he's in the hospital. It broke his ankle and laid in 27 places. Wow. And I went to visit him. I said, Eric, what, uh, what happened? 
He says, well, lay, a parachute landing fall, you're supposed to keep your legs together, your, your feet together, land on the ball of your feet and roll up on the side. That's the correct way to do it. Well, Eric said, Blade, it was, it was just such a beautiful day and it was so peaceful and serene. He said, I forgot to prepare to land. <laughs> <So> <laughs> he was in a cache for six months. <laughs> wow. And up to that point, had they had the Army introduced any guerrilla warfare tactics at all? Would you describe any of it as unconventional? Yes, some, but not a lot. I remember up in Fort Lewis and again at Fort Benning, there was there was some counterinsurgency training, but it wasn't a big it wasn't a big part of the programs. Did that change as you got involved in uh, counterintelligence operations? No, because I was really in. Uh, uh, strict counterintelligence business. I, I wasn't in the infantry and in, in counterinsurgency. Okay. Tell me a little bit about how you got involved in the CIA. Okay, I was going to correct you in the introduction. I was never in the CIA. Oh, okay. No, I was in the Army and in, in intelligence branch and we worked very closely with the CIA, but I was never in the CIA. Okay, thank you for correcting me yeah. on that because there was a little confusion with the Phoenix program. Well, it was started and run by the CIA, but I was an Army officer. Okay. All right. So talk a little bit about counterintelligence. Well, the school was very fun. Now, I suspected I'd known S2s. S2s is an intelligence staff officer. And I knew about being an intelligence staff officer on an infantry unit or doing interviews for personnel security. And that's kind of what I thought. I didn't think I'd be training to be a James Bond. Uh, but I, before the school started, uh, when I got there, it was two weeks till my class started. So they put the young officers in offices around the post to do menial work until our class started. And I got assigned to finance and was typing up uh, finance papers. And the first one that had me type up was a guy who, in the class ahead of me, that had already, of course, been going on. And he was asking for the Army to reimburse him for his money. And when I read his reason, I re thought I realized that counterintelligence school is not just about teaching soldiers what a Soviet tank looks like. I think it was something like this. He said, as we were taken off the submarine off the coast of Puerto Rico, it was raining and I slipped on the deck trying to jump into the rubber rafts that were going to take us into shore. Uh, I lost my pack with all my civilian clothing, my, my false ID, and $200 in my wallet that uh, and I didn't retrieve it. I asked the Army to reimburse me the $200 cash I lost. I couldn't believe it, number one, that that was the type of training we were going to have. And so I went, and number two, that he expected the Army to pay him for his lost money. And I went and asked the finance sergeant in charge, and he says, it's, it's doing, he'll get his money, and it's not an unusual request. And so it, it was really fun. Uh, that I think it was, I can't remember how long it was, I think it was about four months. But it was very interesting. Um, what did you find most interesting about it? Can you take us through a particular event? Oh, not a particular event. The trade craft was, was fun, uh, teaching you how to open envelopes without being able to detect it, teaching you how to writing secret writing with homemade stuff, uh, teaching how to pick locks, uh, uh, teaching how to do surveillance and counter surveillance, uh, teaching you how to be an agent handler, you know, in other words, agent handle your agents in a secure manner, uh, things like that. Okay. And um, was Vietnam counterinsurgency on the table at that point in your mind? No. 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 Okay. Um, so after the, you, you said four weeks? No, no, I think it was about four months. Four months, okay. Four or five months, something like that. So where did you go from there? Well, that's an interesting thing. I, I, I was still expecting to go to Vietnam, and I got my orders and said, uh, you're going to Europe. Okay. So I was sent to Europe uh, with five other guys in the class, and we were all sent. To, at that time in Europe, there was a counterintelligence unit for the, for the Europe. It was located in Stuttgart, Germany. And there was a collection unit that was located at Camp King, just outside of Frankfurt. And I got select, uh, sent to the collection unit. And uh, I got there with the five, and the colonel in charge of the battalion uh, said he was going to have us all interviewed by the outgoing officers, and he would pick you at where. Well, the best job was commander of the uh, U.S. Army Europe Interrogation Center, which called for a major lieutenant colonel. 
but they were all gone. They were in Vietnam. So I was the second. Uh, he he picked me to be the commander of the interrogation unit, and in, in, uh, uh, because there were no other captains and majors and lieutenant colonels around at the time, best job I ever had. I think I sent you a thing on it. Mm -hmm. It was the best job I ever had. You want to talk about what that job entailed? Well, basically at that time, there were about 40,000 people a year coming into West Germany from the East Bloc countries, uh, escaping, uh, being there on business and not returning, uh, literally crawling over the fences and through the mine fields, uh, 40,000 a year. Uh, there were three major camps for them in West Germany, and Gießen was the East Germans, uh, in Nuremberg were all the rest of the Soviet pack bloc, in turn, or, excuse me, uh, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, and so forth, Russia. And up in Hamburg was for worldwide, because we'd bring them in. I had a screening section at each of those places, and they would screen all those people quickly. And those that had high level of intelligence uh, information, uh, were sent to my place. We handled about 400 a month, or 400 a year. So about 1%, uh, would that be 1%, 40,000? Yeah, about 1% of the 40,000 ended up at my place. Okay. And so during that time you got to interact with a lot of different people from Eastern Europe then? I didn't directly, because I didn't speak any of the languages. Uh. But my interrogators did, and I supervised them. Okay. So what were some interrogation tactics during this time? Well, number one, they were all friendly. All right. uh, number one, there was no coercion involved, but they were more than happy to do it because the more information, the better information they gave us. We were in charge of, re I had another section of resettling, either to the United States, Canada, South America, most to Europe, many to West Germany. And they knew that the more helpful they were, the better chances they'd get of coming to America or getting a good re uh, resettlement. So there, there was no coercion involved at all. Okay. And what were your impressions as far as uh, the, the type of people who came through, um, as far as what were some of their appearances? I would say most appeared to be, well, it was a wide variety. You had everything. I remember one was a Hungarian truck driver, and he was authorized to drive trucks from Tur uh, from Hungary to West Germany, and he just turned himself into West Germans. On the other hand, there were people who were university professors and doctors and people like that, and uh, so it, it was a wide range, wide range. Very interesting. Any uh, people come to mind? Any particular individuals who? Uh come to your memory as being significant? Yeah, a couple. A couple of, well, several. Uh, one was, I think I sent you the thing, was my first one was the Czech family. I, I got to, uh, notified of the job on a Friday, uh, and I told the sergeant in charge of my guest reception station, which handled 150, 200 people at a time. We housed them and fed them and everything. And I told him, next time one comes in, call me, and I want to see the end processing. So Sunday night, he called me and he said, we have a Czech family just showed up. And they had crossed the Sunday morning, they had walked to the minefields, went through the minefields, crawled under the fence, turned themselves into West Germany that very morning. Well, normally it would take days and days before they got to us, but he was, I can't remember, I think he was an Air Force major, but anyway, he was in charge of the chemical inserting chemical weapons into rockets in Czechoslovakia. Boy, that was high level of interest to us. So when we, they found out right away and they brought him straight in. It was a man about, I'd say, in his early 30s with his wife and he had two young boys, about six and four. And they were just in shock, you know, when I saw them being in process. They were scared and puzzled and in shock. We had about four months to interrogate him. We didn't do it in a day or two. These things took a long time in most cases. And I took them to the airport because they were my first ones. Normally I'd have my guys do it. And they were happy. They, we were resettling them to Canada. And they were so happy and they were so thankful to me. I never followed them because we weren't allowed to keep contact with the sources. 
the interesting thing is my the major my boss wanted the family to come to America which most wanted to do but he didn't because he had high-ranking family in the, in the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. and he's afraid they'd be persecuted if he went to America so I had to go in and convince my major to let him go to Canada which he reluctantly did mm -hmm. so they went to Canada and I, I never followed him after that but uh, that was one. Another was the first woman. Uh, when I was, each of us five officers, when we got there, we, uh, there were five outgoing officers. And when I was, Tom Whittle was the commander of the European Interrogation Center. And he, uh, he, he took me into an interrogation when I went through the interview process with him. And I was sitting there. And it was a, probably a, East German woman in her late 50s, and she had been uh, uh, on the cleaning crew, the janitor crew, but in the headquarters building of the East German Intelligence Service. So normally a janitor wouldn't be involved, but she knew all the security procedures, she knew the floor diagrams and all that, and on my interrogator, our interrogator was questioning her in German. I could tell she was very nervous, very nervous, and didn't appear to be answering the questions. I watched that for five minutes and I leaned over to Tom and I said, uh, do you want her nervous or do you want her uh, calm? He said, oh, calm. So I was smoking at the time, which everybody in the Army did. I pulled out a pack of cigarettes and offered her one. She grabbed it and let it lean back and started asking all the questions and she was just as calm as she could be. When we left, Tom said, how'd you know that old woman smoked? Well, the East Germans didn't have any money and no filters, and they'd smoke their cigarettes down to, uh, you could just see the nicotine stains on her finger, and I'd noticed that. So when she appeared so nervous, I offered her smoke, and, and the next day the colonel called me and said I had the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember those two. I remember several others also, but that's just an idea. Hmm. And obviously during this time the Soviet Union is a big superpower, the focus of uh, a lot of attention to say the least. What were the fears of nuclear warfare at this time? Not great. <coughs> not, not, it was always in the back of your mind, but we didn't spend our days worrying about it. Was there any training involved oh, at that absolutely. level? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. What did that entail? Well, we, in my case, uh, in my second tour to Germany, I was in the S2 of the Corps. The Corps is made up of three to five divisions. So there, I think there were like 125,000 people in Fifth Corps at the time, headquartered in Frankfurt. And I was uh, in the S2, and I was in charge of the, of the uh, uh, training and supervision of the units on the Iron Curtain border. And so I'd go out and do inspections there. I'd make sure their training was up to snuff. Uh, can't get into great detail about the uh, details. They were, I assume even today I shouldn't. But uh, that, it was almost non-stop training on what to do if the Russians came through the Fulda Gap, wow. which was the most likely approach into West Germany. Hmm. So take us on your path to Vietnam. Well, because I got a, I only had a two-year commitment when I finished OCS. So I could have gotten out of the Army after that wonderful 18 months I had in Germany. But several of my friends, officers, decided they wanted to go see what Vietnam's like. And I decided, well, I do too. So at one of my friend's suggestion, he had done that. He said to the Army, hey, I'm due to get out in three months. I'll agree to another an extension if you'll send me to Special Forces School. And so they did that. They sent him to Special Forces School and on to Vietnam. He said he wanted to be in an A team in Vietnam. So a couple of months later, I did the same thing, except I wasn't interested in Special Forces. I said, if you'll send me to the Intelligence Collection School, as opposed to Counterintelligence Collection School, then I'll go to Vietnam. So that's what I did. And what does Intelligence Collection School, what well, is that like? In, it's a little, little more. Uh, it's a lot more the agent handling training, how to handle your agents, how to do secure programs of communication, how to set up a secure meeting, make sure you're not uh, being observed, uh, how to handle agents, and that sort of thing. And again, a lot more the what they call tradescraft. 
And you mentioned that you wanted to see Vietnam. Uh, I couldn't imagine at that time wanting to go to Vietnam. <laughs> Can you explain that to our audience to kind of put well, us in the mindset? I'll of put that? it this way. I'd spent a full year training to be an infantry officer. Uh, went through all the training to be an infantry officer. But I was in intelligence. I knew I wasn't going to be out there leading an infantry troop. If I had, I'm sure I wouldn't have volunteered. But I knew I would be in a less dangerous position. And since I, uh, you got to understand, that was the biggest thing in the world going on right then for an American soldier. And to have gotten out of the Army, and, and I didn't know where I was going to go. You know, I had no specific uh, interests or anything to pursue. And I really wanted to see what it was like. I really wanted to see it firsthand. Interesting. And uh, after you went through your further training of uh, intelligence collections, um, how, first, how did you arrive in Vietnam? Don't remember the name. It was a huge base, and I got off the plane and said, my God, this is a sauna. Uh, <laughs> but I was amazed at the size of the operation. you got to remember, this would have been in around 1970. So it wasn't at the total height, but it was still a very large operation, very large. Interesting. And what were your first impressions, uh, other than the heat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't really remember much those first few days. I was anxious to get my assignment, and then when I got that, I got out there and wanted to get started. And uh, where were you assigned? Phu Tuc District of Phu Ban Province, which is in the highlands of Vietnam, the mountains, mm -hmm. uh, between Pleiku, which you may have heard of, and the coast. We were we were the province right between Pleiku and the coast, okay. uh, and it was uh, it was very interesting. Was this a, a sparsely populated area? Absolutely, and that's why I wanted the paper, Jason. I want to show you'll understand. I don't remember the exact size of the district. There's the district, and then the province, and then the core. But this is the district. Uh, and again, you're in mountains. Uh, much like the Ozark Mountains, they're a little higher. Mm -hmm. um, they're not like the Rockies. And it was all jungle. It was all jungle or forest, except for this river, a pretty good sized river that ran right through it. And then there was a smaller stream that ran into the river. When I got there, there were three villages, one about here, one about here, and one about here. Uh, everything else was a free fire zone. Okay. If you, if you were moving out there, you know, we were after you. Uh, our headquarters, if you want to call it that, was here in this center village, and we were right next to the stream. Uh, so the main thing to understand is we basically had the three friendly villages where the Vietnamese government had gathered the people in so that he, anybody else coming through were, were enemy. I wondered if you could talk about these villages a little bit. I mean, did they relocate villagers to, uh, to an area in Vietnam where they thought that they would be safe? Um, was this part of the Hearts and Minds campaign? I don't think so. I never uh, talked to anybody that was involved in the, the process, but it, that, they were relocated. See, the mountain yards were totally different than the Vietnamese, totally mm -hmm. different eth ethnic group. And uh, for centuries, they, uh, probably thousands of years, but certainly centuries, they had slice and burn agriculture. So these forests with some clearings, they would go in and they'd cut down the trees, slice and burn them up and farm there. But the uh, jungle and forest soil is not very productive. So after having burned down an area, and maybe two or three years later, the crops are starting to weaken, they'd move to another area. Mm -hmm. And they were generally dispersed, I'm told, throughout the whole area. But when the Vietnam War started, they couldn't have all these, you know, it had been too easy for the VC and NVA to, to operate. Mm -hmm. So they resettled them to these three villages. Uh, but they didn't resettle settle them from here to Saigon or something. I mean, right. they settled them to those three villages. Okay, and they trained these men? Uh, what men is that? The Moneyards. Oh, yeah. In fact, is uh, we had, in our central camp, we had three Moneyard infantry companies of about 100 men each. And they would each, uh, so we had about 300 Moneyard fighting soldiers. and. A company would go out. We'd normally airlift them because it'd take weeks to get out there going up and down the mountains. 
helicopters would come in, we'd lift 100, 100 men and, uh, out and drop them somewhere. And then they would go around for a week, we'd pick them up and bring them back, we'd take another 100 out. Uh, so they rotated about every third week, a company would be out. Uh, going through these areas trying to find people that shouldn't be there. What was the fear of VC infiltration of these villages? That's why I said you're going to be a little disappointed what I got to say about my part in the Phoenix program. Because when I got there, my predecessors had set up informants in each of these villages. And of course there was nobody out here that we had any contact with. If we did, they'd be done for. So we had an, I had informants in each of these three villages hmm. that were already set up. I didn't need to expand anything. So if uh, Van Bo came, decided he wanted to see his mother, which is often the case, I'm using the name as an example, and he hadn't seen his mother in a few months, he might sneak in the middle of the night in the village at 2 o'clock and visit with his mother and be out. Every time that happened, I'd know first thing the next morning. So there was no infiltration of these villages mm -hmm. because I had, so it was, to tell you the truth, not the most exciting job. <laughs> because I had all the information I needed. I was trying to get information of what's going on out here, which occasionally I could get some, but not much. But I, we had the three villages pretty well covered. And were there uh, chiefs in these villages that you interacted with at the time? Uh, yeah, but, but it was somewhat informal. It wasn't like there was one guy in charge of everything. Okay. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about the culture and the customs and the way of life of the Yards. They were wonderful people. They were just absolutely wonderful. They had good values, they were loyal, they were smart. Uh, they were just wonderful people. Uh, but they, they lived in, you know, houses that had grass roofs and were up on stilts. Uh, uh, I think I may have sent you a picture or two, but, but uh, it was very, very primitive culture, but a very, very good culture, yeah. And uh, you were involved in the education there, right? Well, I think that story I sent you, what happened is I was visiting an orphanage school in our central village, and I walked in and there was one teacher and about 20-some students, and the teacher had nothing, it was just chairs, 20 chairs the students were sitting in, and a chalkboard, he didn't even have chalk. When it came time to teach math, he'd take them out and draw numbers in the dirt to teach math. And uh, so that concerned me, so, so I got involved with getting him some educational supplies. Interesting. And uh, you sent me a link about you went out in the field at one point about it. Can you take us through yeah. that episode in your life? We had a 10-man U.S. team, and there were two company-grade infantry officers and two sergeants, infantry sergeants, and they would go out with these, t with these hundred yard mountain yard companies. And so if, the, if you got into contact, you needed the Air Force called in, or if you needed artillery support, uh, the Americans would do that, okay? Well, these two guys were out 50% of the time, and which is a strain enough on themselves. By the way, the rest of the team was the team chief, me, the Phoenix uh, guy, we were both captains. And then there was a, uh, there was a communication sergeant, a medic, and I don't remember what else, there were 10 total. Well, one of the lieutenants, infantry lieutenants, got wounded, and so he couldn't go out. So the other guy was basically out full time, and after a couple of weeks, I told, uh, I told the team chief that I'd replace him, because I'd been trained in infantry, I thought I could do it. And he's more than happy to do that, but because the Phoenix program was so successful, we had a bounty on our head, uh, and the, the rule was Phoenix people could not go on empty operations because of that bounty on their head. Mm -hmm. They'd be the first one taken out. Uh, but he said okay because he had to do something. He could keep that guy out in the field forever. So I went on two different operations to replace one of those. And then the headquarters found out I was doing it and they called my boss and told him better stop it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how long were these operations? Normally a week. And week you were out each. there for a week? Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you take us through a typical day out in the field? Just stomping through the forest and looking for things. Uh, uh, and when you run into uh, getting a firefight, you respond. Now, are, was the enemy, were they 
the North Vietnamese troops, the VC? Uh, there were both. There were both, and and they were trans. You know, they weren't camped out here, as far as we could tell. Uh, I'd say they. We I ran across a couple small camps. I, I got. They had a poster Ho Chi Minh in, in this one little camp we ran across. I got it in the VC flag uh, and I took home as souvenirs. But mostly they were traveling through uh, both NVA and VC. Uh, we didn't have a whole lot, the whole year I was there, I don't think we ever had any attack on any of the villages. We had attacks, there was a bridge down here that they blew up one night, but uh, we didn't have any attacks on the villages while I was there. Hmm. And um, I'm assuming in this area, this isn't, you know, the minefields, this isn't the punji sticks. Uh, what, what was the, the most dangerous element? Well, uh, or was probably it? be a shot in the firefight. Uh, so it was the most arms. dangerous. But that lieutenant that got injured was injured by a punji stick. I mean, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah they, they used some of that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, was there any significant events while you were out there during this time? The first week, I think it was the second night, and we were just setting up camp out there in the forest. And they, of course, we're in a circular perimeter, and of course, I and my sergeant were in the middle. And we were just setting up, it was late afternoon, and all at once I thought we were War Three uh, because these hundred guys, uh, probably half of them started firing. I, uh, my God, they were firing grenade launchers and machine guns and M16s, and I thought, boy, we've got it. We've hit a VC company or NBA battalion. <laughs> uh, but it turned out it was one NBA that was walking a Martin Yard. 13 or 14 year old boy down a trail and he had run into our perimeter and they shot and killed the NBA guy and the, the boy had bullets he had a big floppy shirt on he had literally had bullet holes in his shirt but he was not he was not in hmm. what had happened is that there were still villages out here small small villages or a family of five or something and the NBA had come into this village that was still out here and taken this 14-year-old boy, and the NVA guy was being sent back to their headquarters to make him fight for them, huh. you know, a 14-year-old boy. Well, he got what was coming to him, uh, but that was why he was with that boy on that trail, because yeah. he was taking him back to their headquarters to make him be a soldier for him. And did your men recover men like this often who had been conscripted into the NBA? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, 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 not often, but it happened. Right. Yeah. And did you develop relationships with your people out there? Oh, absolutely. Because, because I didn't have to do a lot, because the threat wasn't the typical threat the Phoenix program was designed for. It was not like being in the Vietnamese area of the country. Because we had such good relations, and Montagnard loved us as much as we loved them. Because I had such a good informant system, I had plenty of time. So I'd take on my two interpreters, and later on I got a sergeant to work for me too. And we'd get in the army jeep, and we would drive out to these villages, and I'd just visit with the chief, and I'd, you know, try to develop relations. And like I said, this one time I, I found this school that needed help, and so I got it. Yeah. I was more, a, uh, I, I would have to say in the year I was there, I was more a, a, a what do you call it, civil service type of uh, thing than I was a, a Phoenix advisor. Right. And um, was there medical treatment available to these civilians? And I, If I remember right, there was a small, there, there was a small clinic in one of the villages, and then of course we had a medic, mm -hmm. and they would both he would he would work together. But there was no high level medical care. No, if somebody got really sick and we were informed, we'd call a helicopter in and have uh, lifted up to play coup where they could get taken care of. Okay, and um, you were an advisor out there. Um, can you talk about the effect of the the effectiveness of these? Uh, Mountain Yard fighting forces? They were very good. Uh, you learn so much in Fort Benning about how to operate in the field. When you're out there moving to an area, you got to have out flank security, front security, back security. You got to keep so far apart in case a mortar round comes in, you don't want more than one guy to get in. Uh, I was amazed. Uh, 
I, when I first went out with that first mountain yard company, we got out there and started moving through the openings and forests. And I looked around, and those mountain yard soldiers were deployed like it was a diagram out of the Fort Benning Infantry School. I mean, they they had been well trained. They were excellent soldiers. Yeah. And were they more of a guerrilla fighting force, or more conventional? Well, I would say conventional. By guerrilla, you mean you you're going into a, a known area, a controlled area, and you're trying to root out the people, what the Phoenix program was designed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in this case, it was more a regular infantry operation. Okay. And uh, could you talk a little bit about maybe your successes and your failures in Vietnam? Anything that comes to mind? Well, on that first tour, uh, I think my successes were developing good relations here. Like I said, there wasn't a lot of Phoenix or intelligence work to do. It was set up and almost automatic. Uh, dealing with the informants and keeping them happy and well paid, we actually paid them. Uh, and, and that sort of thing was a success because we got the information as soon as it happened and sometimes before, which is when we really wanted it. But I'd say my other success were those relationships I established with uh, local people. Okay. And you mentioned a second tour? Yeah. Did you uh, go back stateside during this time? No. Uh, gosh, I don't know how much time we got, Jason, but I'll, I'll just tell you that uh, the policy at that time was uh, you were here in Vietnam, you got an R&R &R of seven days, and you could t take a seven-day leave. So you got two seven-day sessions that first year. Mm -hmm. And the seven days started when you got to where you're going. And that time on R&R, &R, and you could take your seven-day leave and just basically be another R&R. &R. You could go to Hong Kong, Sydney, Australia, the Philippines, Hawaii. You could go to any of those places at government expense mm -hmm. and, and uh, take a seven-day R&R. So in that first year, I took one to Bangkok and one to Hong Kong. And then another policy they had was if you would extend six months in Vietnam, they would send you anywhere in the world for 30 days uh, at their expense for the travel, you know, to get there and back. And then in the six months, you got two more R&Rs, or another R&R &R and another seven-day leave. Oh. And remember, you weren't paying taxes in a combat zone, and you weren't paying postage in a combat zone. There were a lot of freebies. So I'm sitting there as a single guy, and i saying, and you could tell them you would only extend for certain locations. So I told them, okay, if you'll give me a collection job in Saigon, I will extend six months. Hmm. I'd never been to South America, so I put down Rio de Janeiro is where I wanted to go. And the 30 days started when you got there, and it ended the day you checked in for your flight back. So you'd fly through America, and you'd stay with mom and dad a couple of days each way. So you're gone like five or even six weeks. A lot of guys went to Copenhagen and traveled Europe for a month and then went back. So I said, I want to bridge in here. Well, I was dating, had been dating a girl I met in Munich uh, from, from California. And I stopped there on the way home to visit her and we decided we wanted to get married. So I canceled the, the Rio de Janeiro and flew home. We got uh, to Wichita, Kansas. We got married, went to a honeymoon in New York City and I went to uh, went back to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. What did your family think about all this? Was this the first um, time they had met? <laughs> they, uh, my mother was worried sick the whole time. I think my dad was concerned, mm -hmm. but uh, they weren't real happy with me, no. <laughs> I understand. And uh, what about your siblings at that time? Were they starting to get a little older at this time? Yeah, my sister had been in her early 30s and, and uh, my brother was a teenager and my other sister was in her early 20s. I don't know what they thought. They thought I was stupid, I think, is what they thought. So you had a teenage brother during this time and you're in Vietnam. Um, was he interested in any of the anti-war movements at all? No, he no. was like 13, 14 years old. Oh, okay, old. a little, a little yeah. yeah. Um, and during this time, course we can come back to this at another point but had you had any experiences with any anti-war de demonstrations up to this point no. no no okay so you go back to Saigon what was Saigon like again it was a very good experience uh, they housed us in a French villa I had about 
15 or 20 guys in my collection unit. Uh, they a block away was another French villa. That's where we worked. It was in, we were running agents through the whole core area of Saigon. We were running, you know, uh, secret agents, if you will, and getting information that we then turned over to the, to the uh, Vietnamese and the Americans. It, it was a good experience. Uh, it was a, a pretty good life, really. Uh, when they danger that I could see, and had wonderful French and Vietnamese restaurants in the neighborhood, and, and uh, it was it was a good experience. Um, did you interact with South Vietnamese officials during this time? Not really, especially not second tour. Uh, the only Vietnamese. I interacted with, we were a counterpart unit, you know, you're not going to take an American and go out there and, and run a secret agent to, out in some village and, and be successful. So we were a counterpart, we had a counterpart role okay. in that we trained and supervised the Vietnamese that went out and handled the agents. So we weren't directly handling the agents ourselves. And the Vietnamese that we were training and working with were the only ones that uh, I dealt with. And was, were they effective? Was there any lack of trust with these? Wasn't any lack of trust, and they were effective, but to be perfectly honest with you, I, I think the, the values and working relationship with the Montagnards was, was probably better than it was with the Vietnamese, okay. who were more political and in some cases corrupt. Right. Um, did you have any political ideas about this during the time you were in Vietnam? As far as uh, U.S. involvement in Vietnam? Yeah, I did. Uh, I thought we were doing the right thing, and from my experiences, it was it was helpful. We were trying to prevent them from what eventually happened, I think, when we deserted the country. But by the same token, I had some questions about whether we should, we, the America, should be out there trying to solve all the world's problems. You know, so I didn't fully agree with the effort on the grand scale, on the geostrategic scale, if you will. Uh, I, I had some serious concerns there, but as far as locally and what I was doing, I had no problems. Um, I'm curious about interrogation methods used by intelligence. Can you talk about that a little bit at all? Yeah, uh, both in counterintelligence and somewhat in the collection course, uh, they covered interrogation techniques pretty good. Um, things like good cop, bad cop, which everybody's aware of, and, and other techniques like that to try to, to get people. Now, we weren't trained to do anything like this waterboarding, mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, we went through that kind of stuff in order for us to understand what could happen to you, us if we were captured and uh, what could happen to our agents if they were captured. So there was inflicted on us some, some pretty severe things like that, but we were not trained how to do that. I want to make that clear. The training we got in interrogation was how to get things from people either willingly or unwillingly by tricking them. Um, and so that's what most of the training was. And do you feel in your experience that um it's more effective as far as a non-torture means of getting information rather than, uh, you know, what you're talking about, just interrogating them and yeah. them feel comfortable. Um, if you can get the information through non-coercive means, the likelihood that it will be good information is much higher. Mm. Uh, the only time I would approve of something like waterboarding, which I do not consider torture, I mean, I've been to it, it's, it's like you feel you're drowning, um, it should only be used as it was when we're trying to find out to prevent the next 9-11. Mm -hmm. Now, the people who say we should not do it under any circumstances, no, I don't think we ought to be pulling out fingernails and things that the Chinese have done over the history. Uh, but things like that, that there's no real damage other than the, phys the psychological stress, is what I'd call it. Psychological stress in order to prevent the next 9-11, I totally agree with. Um, what are your feelings on uh, other psychological stress, such as keeping a, an individual awake for a certain amount of time? Right. I put that in the same category. 
keep him, keeping them naked in a cold room. I'm not saying freeze to death or get frostbite to lose fingers, but I'm saying those sorts of things that can cause extreme stress, not for everyday small stuff. Again, for the most important things, when you know the man has information and you're going to save lives, then I would agree to all those things, like we did with man, uh, Noriega in Panama. We, we, he hated rock music, I understand, and we played rock music very loud. I'm trying to think of some of the others. Um, claiming you already know the information, and in some cases you do already know the information, but by telling him, you're letting him believe, or her, letting him or her believe that you really know the answer, they're more willing to confirm the answer and maybe give you a little more. Hmm. So there's things like that. Uh, little tricks of the trade, so to speak. Um, a lot of the media portrayed the Phoenix program during Vietnam as torturous, uh, who used barbaric te techniques to get information, such as fingernail pulling and other crude devices used during. Uh, in your experience, how accurately did the media portray, uh, portray the Phoenix program? I can only speak for my experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what was done otherwise, but I think they they uh, had a lot of false information. They exaggerated some things. Now, not to say things didn't happen. In my little place, for example, my counterpart was a, 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 a Vietnamese major, the head of intelligence there, and we had this little building we were in, and they would bring the cap captured NVA or VC in and interrogate them. And the entire year I was there, I only saw two things. Number one, you know, they, they have a, a telephone hand crank thing that basically charges up, you run it for your telephone. And I saw one sitting on his desk, and I said, what's that for? You don't use that kind of telephone. And he kind of smirked and said, well, I use it on the, on the our prisoners. Well, you know, what you do is you attach the wires to a guy's genitals or somewhere else, and then you crank that phone. Okay, I never saw him do it, never saw him do it, but he had it there. Another time I was there in the office and they brought in a captured, I don't remember what it was, NBA or BC, and they had his arms uh, at the elbows with a wire behind his back. And the major started yelling questions at him and trying to get answers. And again, I couldn't understand what they were saying, but I, I said, it's fine with me. And he went. But then he laid back and just smashed him right in the face. And I immediately told him to stop, and he looked at me like, what's going on? And he didn't do it again, but I got to thinking, I need to report this. So I went straight back to camp, and I reported to my boss what had happened, and we called up and reported it. I don't think anything happened. That was the only time I saw a prisoner abused uh, was when that guy that was bound behind his back was, was slugged in the face. That was the only thing I saw. All right, so again, we were talking about techniques that you witnessed in uh, Saigon during this time that you reported to your yeah. authorities. Um, so how long were you in Saigon? Uh, six months. Okay, and six months extension tour. What was uh, most difficult about your time there? Being away from my new wife. We got married in between tours. <laughs> How long were you in a relationship with your wife? Uh, we met in Munich in 1968, okay. and we were married in 71 or 2. Okay. 71. So you guys have been seeing each other for a while. How did you maintain communication with her and your family while you were in Vietnam? Tapes, letters, letters and tapes. I'd write letters, but they had little three-inch tape recorders, and we'd make a verbal tape, and I still got them today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Um, so did you come back to the state side after your, tour, your second tour in Vietnam? Yes, we were assigned to Fort Huachuca, Arizona, which is about uh, 90 miles from Tucson and 30 miles from the Mexican border. Uh, little town of Sierra Vista and the Army Post. The intelligence school had been moved there, and I went to the intelligence officer advanced course for a year. And did your wife live on base with you during this time? We lived off base in a okay. government apartment. 
Okay. And um, at what point did you have children? We had uh, our first son in 1973. By that time, I was back in Germany. We were in Frankfurt. And okay. We had our first son in 1973. Okay. And uh, you went back to Frankfurt. Did your wife yeah. accompany you there? Not initially, because you had, if you didn't get government housing, she couldn't travel with you. You had to prove the, to the Army that you had rented an acceptable apartment on the economy. And because only those coming direct from Vietnam could get government housing. Since I'd spent a year, then I had to stay, get me a, a private. Once I got the apartment, then they brought her over. It's about 30 days. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and how long were you in the military? I was in 12 years active duty and 15 years in reserves. Okay. And uh, in which year did you come back and stay in reserve? Uh, 1979. Okay. And at what point did you decide that you wanted to um, go back to school? Well, while I was in the Army. The thing is, I was at Kansas State teaching the ROTC, and my, wife, and my second wife was on the faculty there. Uh, my first wife had died in Berlin. Uh, and so I got married and the Army said they were going to send me in a company to Korea. And she was pregnant with our first child. You know, I had two, two, six and a, seven and under at home and I wasn't about to leave her and <laughs> being pregnant and two little kids and working full time. So I got out and stayed right at K-State and got a master's. My condolences on your first wife. My Excuse me? My condolences on your first yeah. wife, I wasn't aware. Yeah. Um, so you were teaching ROTC at Kansas State. Was there any problems uh, reintegrating into a civilian lifestyle for you? No, nope, not at all. Not at all. And you were teaching ROTC. Um, so, and with the fall of Saigon in 1975, what were your impressions of that? What were your initial reactions? Well, I just lost my first wife, so to tell you the truth, uh, I, I don't remember much about it except that it happened. I didn't have, I had other things to worry about. I had a, I had a 22 month old and a two month preemie baby to take care of and I wasn't too concerned about what was going on. But afterwards, as I look back, as I say, I think we deserted, we being America, the politicians, whomever deserted that country and left them in a terrible situation. Um, you mentioned the premature baby. Was there a pregnancy difficulty? No. What happened is our first son had been born in Frankfurt by a cesarean section because he was breech. We wanted a baby about two years later and she got pregnant at exactly the right time and she was just short of seven months into the pregnancy when she started getting headaches. And uh, we went to the local army hospital and the same guy that delivered our baby was now in the Berlin hospital, Dr. Boyce. And he knew her socially because he's next door neighbor to my boss and we knew him socially. And he told me, he said, Glenn, with a pregnant woman having headaches, I wouldn't worry. But I know Mitch and he said, there's something there. So he did a bunch of tests. He told me if it was a tension headache, he gave her a shot in the neck, and if it went away, it was tension. It didn't make a long story short. It turned out it was a malignant brain tumor. Mm -hmm. So uh, she stopped breathing and everything. In fact, as I was visiting with him, and he said, he said, come see me Monday morning. If she isn't better, we're going to light flight her to Kaiserslautern uh, or Landstuhl, I think, in West Germany because he realized they couldn't handle it there. He didn't know what it was, but I'm sitting there talking to him, and all at once his nurse comes running in and says, Ward 3 stat. And so I thought, I didn't know what the word stat meant, and I thought he was going to see a patient. He jumped up and ran out without a word, so I said, well, I'll go back and visit my wife in the room. I walked in, there were three doctors and five nurses, and basically, when they rushed to the local German hospital and, and she was gone. So he asked me, do we save the baby? Evidently, it's up to me. And you know, I was in shock. I didn't know she was seriously ill. I knew something was the matter. And he came out and said, uh, Clay, the brain scan is flat. She's gone. Do you want to save the baby? 
or try. And I said, well, what's the chances of it being severely disabled? Because I remember at that time, not today, but then seven months, you know, probably wouldn't make it. He said, probably survival at 10 percent. And I said, well, what's permanent disability, blindness and mental and none? He said, probably 90 percent at this point. But I, so I'm sitting there in a state of shock. I just locked my wife, and now he's asked me to decide whether to save this. But I said, if there's a chance, we got to do it. So we did, and she made it. She only weighed two pounds, but she made it. Wow. Yeah. It's very tragic. Yeah, it was. Um, so during your time at Kent State working on the Masters, had your um, experience of Vietnam contributed at all to your career um, aspects at all? Yeah, did you say Kent State? Oh, I'm sorry, I mean Kansas State. Yeah, no. <laughs> I interviewed at Kent State. Okay. Uh, I'd say yes in two ways. Number one, uh, as I was teaching the ROTC kids, it allowed me as a combat veteran to relay things that they need to know about. Mm. Okay, that was one way. Uh, another way I'd say is it made me want realize what's important in life. And that's at least two ways it helped. And uh, at what point did you decide you wanted to go into education? I think pretty much when I got out. As I say, 4-H was a large part of what I wanted to do. So I majored in adult education at Kansas State, and the professor there was going to be the head of 4-H in Iowa. And he talked me into coming up there and being an area 4-H agent for him. So I did that for two years. I realized that at that point I had three little kids, and I was spending all my time with other people's kids. I had no time for my own. So I talked to my wife, and. When we were visiting her parents here, I came in and visited two departments at Oklahoma State. And let me just tell our listeners, we have a great university here. Nothing against Iowa State. They are a fine university too. But I was in their extension service and I went and visited the department head. And I was 40, 40 years old at the time, something like that. And I visited the department head and said, I'm thinking of getting a master's. And so he looked at my he looked at my transcript and everything. And he was real concerned that as a 19-year-old, 21 years before, I'd gotten a D in college algebra, and he was really concerned about that. Now, the fact that I'd gotten the master's with straight A's at Kansas State didn't seem to impress him, but that D as a 19-year-old in algebra really worried him. And then he proceeded to tell me how many hoops I had to jump through. Now, you have to do this, and you have to do this. So I was down here at Christmas visiting my wife's parents, and, uh, he set me up appointments with the head of international programs and the head of adult education here. And in both cases, the reaction, like in uh, Agued, where I ended up, and he, he said, Dr. Bob Terry, he said, Glade, what do you want to do when you finish? So I told him what I want to do when I finish. I'd like to work in international education and development. I had no interest in being a high school life teacher. I didn't have any interest there, but I wanted to be able to work in international education and development. So in contrast to what the Iowa State Department had, Dr. Terry leaned back and says, well, I think we can put a, together a program that will meet your needs. Hmm. <laughs> and the Ag Ed head at the time said the same thing in different words. And so that was the two reactions I got. So there's no doubt in my mind where I was coming. I came hmm. to Oklahoma State. And your second wife is from Oklahoma. Yes, her father was the head of Ag Ed here for many years, Dr. Bob Price. Yeah, and I loved it town of Stillwater and, and Oklahoma State. I couldn't get a job right away because there weren't any openings. So I applied for a couple jobs up in Kansas and was offered one of the two, but it's in western Kansas. And I really didn't think I would take the kids out there. So I turned it down and waited. Unfortunately, after about nine months, there was an opening in an international program where I worked as a grad student. And so I was hired for that and I was, uh, for 10 years, I just loved to work, but they were going to close an office, so I left to a different part of the university. Hmm. And so you decided to stick around? Um, yeah. What are some of your favorite experiences here at OSU, or at Stillwater? Well, I'd say the quality instructors I had. The quality of instruction was a good experience. Uh, the sports, of course, were a good experience. I was here in 1988, and in that year we had uh, Barry Sanders win the Heisman Trophy. We had uh, the best baseball player, Robin Ventura. 
was named the best college baseball player. Uh, one of our golfers won the national championship, and John Smith was named the Sullivan Award as the best amateur athlete that year. So the quality of sports when we were in the late 80s was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. Just wonderful. And then, of course, I just enjoyed the university and the international travel. Like I say, for 10 years I did international programs, which is basically I did a lot of travel overseas and negotiating, getting projects for the university overseas. Oh. And um, obviously you had traveled before your experience in the United States military, but did your military service reinforce your uh, ideas about wanting to teach it internationally and to travel more? Um, how did your uh, military experience contribute to your career in that aspect? Well, as I say, I, I lived in, in uh, total in Asia for a year and a half and two years, a total of five years in Germany, and I, I love to travel internationally. Uh, so I love the travel aspect. Most importantly, I love the ability to feel like you're doing some good work when you're helping the developing world uh, increase their education and, and development. It's, it's a very good feeling. It was very satisfying professionally. Do you ever... Uh Wonder what happened to the to the Moton Yards that you had personal relationships with? Have you ever tried to contact any of them afterwards? I haven't tried to contact them, but I think I shared with you. Uh, uh, I've, I've I've worried about the Moton Yards a lot. I worried about the Vietnamese too because they were also persecuted after we abandoned them. Uh, but I'm particularly worried about the Moton Yards. Uh, I did not know it, but evidently there's a group called Counterparts. If you were an advisor, uh, you can belong to it. I just learned of this less than a year ago. Turns out they had a meeting in, uh, I can't remember, in South Carolina, I believe. And I think I sent you the NBC Today Show coverage of the reunion of my favorite interpreter and my two lieutenants, the infantry mm -hmm. lieutenants I told you about. And I was so happy to see Fonsu because he was my favorite interpreter. He's a Montagnard that he, he was just wonderful for us. He was a wonderful fellow. According to the news program, when we left, he spent 12 years in a prison camp. The communists put him in a prison camp for 12 years. Uh, but evidently in the early 90s maybe, late 90s, he was brought to the United States, him and his wife and one son. He had three children. They only allowed one to come. These other two were back there. But I got all this from the news, the NBC Today news story. And he spent 15 years working in a factory there. But he was suffering from cancer. This is a couple of months ago that the news show happened. Mm -hmm. And I, unfortunately, I got an email last week that he passed away. But. Uh, that he's just one example, 12 years in a prison camp because he had helped the Americans. Mm. I feel, feel terrible about it, to tell you the truth, and I think our country should. In many ways, the, the Vietnam Memorial in Washington was almost a, a time of healing for the Vietnam era war. Um, have you ever been to the memorial yourself? Oh, several times, yeah. What were your impressions of that? I think it's it's very moving. There's a lot of controversy, a big black thing with names on it, to, you know, like the Wall of Shame or something. But I don't agree. I think it's, I think what it represents is very moving. And if you get that paper and that charcoal and put your buddy's names have been killed, and I, I just think it's a very moving and appropriate shrine. And do you memorialize personally for friends in Vietnam? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what advice would you give society whenever it comes to international affairs today um, and treatment of the veterans? Well, that's two separate issues. Uh, one thing that I'd say about the international situation is we need to follow our great former president, Henry Bennett, who's help set up AID, point four as it was known. Uh, these programs that aren't big, gargantuan dam buildings or building modern roads, uh, these, these programs that are, that are 
small scale directly helping people improve their lives. I fully support all that. Um, as far as, uh, I can't remember your second part of the question. Well, you? let's just focus on the international affairs. That was more of a two part question. Yeah. Uh, well, as I say, we, we had a lot of good experiences. Uh, I had projects when I was in international programs here. We brought 52 Pakistani technical teachers for a year and, and, and taught them how to teach better, taught them more technology, helped them improve. I had another program with, uh, we had a program with Jordan. We, people that are not aware of it don't realize the impact Oklahoma State has had internationally. Of course, many people know about the Ethiopian program. Because of Henry Bennett being the first point four director, he set up the Ethiopian program. And anybody who wants to read about it can read about it on Oklahoma Oral History. You've had several people who were involved with it. That was a tremendous program. We established, uh, say we, OSU established the first university there, uh, uh, agriculture university like a land grant university. I'm told, I've never been to Ethiopia, it's one of the countries I haven't been to, but I'm told if you're from OSU and go to Ethiopia, you'll be treated like a VIP. Uh, we had programs in many, many other countries. In Thailand, President Halligan spoke at an international uh, banquet here a few years ago, and he said that uh, he knew of about OSU's experience in Thailand, but he didn't realize the extent until he traveled there after he gave up his presidency here. And he said, I got to Thailand, and he said, I learned that five of the major university presidents in Thailand were OSU graduates. And wow. you go to Thailand, and you say you're from OSU, and you'll be treated again like royalty. So it's just very satisfying. We've, been, we've had tremendous success at this university. All right, so uh, throughout your life, is there one defining moment for you? Well, for those for those young people that think 4-H is just showing lambs at the county fair or cooking pies for the county fair, I, I, I've had a, a very interesting life and I credit most of that directly to my 10 years in 4-H in Kansas. And that may, well how does that relate? Well, let me just run to it. I spent 10 years in 4-H in Kansas, went away to college, the sophomore year is asked by 4-H program to go to Italy for six months which I did. And then I graduated from college and was asked by the National 4-H Council to go to India for six weeks, which I did. And then I joined the, or was drafted into the Army and graduated from the infantry school at the very height of the Cold, uh, Vietnam War. Instead of infantry, they commissioned me in intelligence. I don't know, but I suspect because all that international experience I had. So I get in the intelligence branch and I'm the best job I ever had was the commander of the U.S. Army Europe Interrogation Center. The most rewarding because we're taking refugees that had escaped at great risk from East Bloc countries and resettling them in, in the West. Yeah, every day I got to see the wonderful expressions of people who lived in communism and now had a chance to live free. Then after that, um, I went to Vietnam, of course and came back and was sent back to Europe again as Deputy Commander of the Counterintelligence Unit in West Berlin in 1974-75, the height of the Cold War. Very interesting. But then I get out of the Army and decide to come here to OSU to get my doctorate. I apply for graduate assistantship in the Office of International Program because that's my interest. And I'm sure that my extensive international experience up to that point helped me get that job, which allowed me to then, after finishing my doctorate, work for 10 years in international programs here at OSU. So I, I credit it. I think it's just a one long line, and the start of that line was my 4-H experiences back in Kansas. So for these young people today, do what you're interested in, even if you think it's just a, a youth program that keeps you in Oklahoma. As far as uh, your non-military life, what do you consider the pinnacle of your life, your, your most proud of achievement, your proudest achievement? My children. I have three children. I'm very proud of them. Okay. And if you had something that you wanted to tell your children about your experiences internationally, what would that be? 
Well, funny you should ask, Jason, because when I retired from OSU, I started writing my memoirs. And my son, a couple years ago, had it printed off. So the answer to your question is right there. Wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> He, so there, he is no one, <laughs> there is no they can, one. They can read, everything we've discussed today is in there and uh, a lot more. And that's, I, I had kids after age 30 and my grandkids started being born after a, their parents age 30. So uh, I wanted to make sure that the, the doddering old man in the corner that they knew as their grandfather, you know, had a good life. Uh, and uh, I started to ask this question earlier. Um, the Vietnam veterans, that was a learning experience for veteran reintegration into society. What advice would you give to either the government or to society to aid our veterans into reintegrating socially? Well, I think there are some programs, but to be honest, uh, uh, I don't know when people are going to be looking at this, but there's a big scandal in the VA mm -hmm. right now, and I think that needs to be addressed. Uh, there's only so much you can do to help people get jobs. I think things are being done. Uh, I didn't see, to address an earlier question you had, because after Vietnam, before Vietnam, I was, you know, either overseas in Europe or I was in very isolated military posts. Mm -hmm. I didn't directly see any of the protests to the war. And then after the war, I was out in the middle of the Arizona desert for a year and back to Europe. So I didn't personally experience anything except when I came home from Vietnam, and I don't remember whether it was the first or second trip, I just remember well. We landed at an air, air, airport or air base in California, and there were these hippies behind the fence who were cursing at us and calling us baby killers. And I wasn't speed on, spit on, but I spit at. Um, but that disturbed me very much. As I think I said earlier, I don't blame the American and the young people for objecting to the war, because I don't think it was the way to go about things anyway. But I do object to the Americans abusing on the streets of this country draftees that they had sent to that war and then were being abused on the streets and the government did nothing to stop it. I, I'm very upset about that. So I can't remember what the question was, but I wanted to get that in. <laughs> I'm glad you shared that with me. Um, I like to ask this question to veterans because often, as you know, war brings out both the best and the worst of humanity. What are those facets of humanity that you've seen or personally been affected by? I can't think of anything really bad other than the dead and wounded of my friends in the mountain yards. I didn't, didn't have anybody I lost when I was in Saigon. But the dead and the wounded, and, uh, but they were trying to protect their country from communism, which when it took over, we saw what happened. Fon Su spent 12 months in a labor camp just because he helped Americans. I think America needs to not desert something that they've gotten themselves involved with. It doesn't have to be a big effort, but there needs to be continuing support. And uh, we didn't do it in Vietnam, and we may not be doing it today, and that, that upsets me. Are you referring to ISIS and Iraq, the contemporaneous situation in Iraq yeah, today? Yeah, I feel if we'd have kept a small group of a few thousand soldiers there, this wouldn't have happened. And the same thing in Afghanistan. I'm afraid when we pull out of there, the women of that country are going to be right back to where they were before, and it breaks my heart. On the other side of that, what are the greatest facets of humanity that you've experienced? Well, I'd have to tell you the truth, Jason. I'd have to think about that a long way. Uh, people say everybody's alike. The, the, the Italians, I still remember some Italian, but not much. But they have a saying, total apiece una, total apiece una mundi. Monday, something like that. Anyway, it's all the countries are one world. In other words, everybody's alive. Mm -hmm. I think there's some truth to that, but anybody that tries to put that too far is going to get in trouble because there are some people, as in any society, there are some societies where the values of that society do not match what I think is a civilized way of acting. And, and having worked most of my life in international education and development in one form or another, uh, I, I 
really think that we need to continue to take advantage of the goodness and try to avoid the badness. And uh, sometimes that's hard to do. Absolutely. And uh, I have one final question, and that is, how would you like to be remembered? I think as a, as a good father and a productive citizen. That's the two things I would like to a, a good father and a productive citizen. Well, um, I would like to thank you personally for your service to your country as one who's benefited from growing up in a peaceful environment and democracy. Um, and I'd also like to thank you for sharing your story with us. I enjoyed it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you.